Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Hort Steryman monthly webinar series. My name is Abby Bauer, and I'm an editor for Hort Steryman magazine. I will serve as your host today, and this webinar focuses on dairy calf housing. For years, individual housing has been the norm on many dairy farms, but more recently, pair and group housing has grown in popularity. During today's presentation, we'll cover the benefits and challenges of raising pre-weaned calves in small groups, and we will learn some of the best management practices that are known right now to optimize calf health and achieve success in these systems. Our sponsor for today's webinar is Agriplastics. We thank them for their support of this program and helping us provide this opportunity for all of you. If you're listening to the presentation live, you have a you can print out a copy of the presentation slides. You can find that in the handout section of the GoToWebinar control panel. Just click on that PDF link and then you can print it out for future reference. Also, if you have any questions for today's presenter, please type them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel and we will answer them following the presentation. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Whitney Knauer to our webinar. Dr. Knauer is an assistant professor of dairy production medicine at the University of Minnesota's College of Veterinary Medicine. She completed her veterinary degree at the University of Pennsylvania in 2010, had an internship and resi re residency in ambulatory and production medicine at Cornell University, and then received her PhD from the University of Minnesota in 2017. Today, she teaches both dairy and small ruminant production medicine courses at the University of Minnesota and her research focuses on young stock health and welfare. Dr. Knauer, welcome to the webinar and we look forward to hearing your presentation titled Housing Calves in Small Groups, The Pros, Cons and Best Practices. Great, thank you so much um, for that introduction, Abby, and uh, thank you to Horton's Dairyman for inviting me to speak with you all today and, and to all of you for joining. It looks like we have 129 people on, um, which is exciting. Um, and also special thanks to Agroplastics um, for, the, for the sponsorship there. Uh, I, I was just on their website this morning and they're, they're uh, doing some, some larger calf hutches. So that's exciting um, and has potential for pair housing. So um, without further ado, we're, we're gonna, gonna move on into the presentation. So um, this is something that I like to start a lot of these pair and small group housing talks with. Um, and so this is, if, if we look on the left-hand side of the screen there, there's um, calves housed in pairs. So that's on a dairy in, in Southern Minnesota. Um, we have small groups there, kind of in the, in the next one down. Um, large groups, that's very common in the upper Midwest to have large groups of 20 to 25 with calves on an auto feeder. Um, and then at the very bottom, this is uh, less common, um, certainly more common in our, our grazing organic herds. Um, but, but housing calves with kind of with their dam um, during their, their growth period or their milk fed phase. And so, um, you know, traditionally we've, we've raised calves individually, about 70 to 75 percent of calves in the U.S. anyway are, are housed individually during the pre-weaning period. Um, but um, that's changing. And so this is a question, so the, the, the question isn't here, but um, the question that I, I posed um, that has been posed several times um, to, to audiences at conferences um, is what is the future of calf housing? So what do you think, audience, um, we're going to be, how, how do you think we're gonna be raising our calves in the next 20 years? And I asked this question to an audience of about 90 veterinarians um, at the, our, our bovine practitioners annual meeting last year in October. Um, and I was actually very surprised to see this result. Um, and so um, the vast majority of participants thought that we would be housing our calves either in pairs or in small groups during the pre-weaning period. Um, and so, uh, you know, just the, the, the future of calf housing um, is, is social housing. And I think particularly care housing, I'm a big proponent of pair housing um, because I think it's, it's an easy shift um, from individual housing, but certainly um, there are some advantages to, to small groups. And so um, we're gonna talk about those kind of advantages and disadvantages in the next couple slides. And so um, the, the next thing I'd like you to, to think about um, are thinking about kind of what's the best thing for the producer and, and also what's the best thing for the calf. So we can't forget about the calf, right? She's kind of our stakeholder um, when we're thinking about um, housing management. 
Um, and so when we think about, you know, this is very simplified version of this, um, but when we think about the producer, you know, what does this, this Cabot producer, um, I, I did my undergrad in Vermont, and so I'm very fond of Cabot cheese. Um, so what, what does the producer want um, when, when thinking about CAF housing programs and CAF housing management? Um, well, she wants something that's economical, um, something that's labor efficient, and a system that results in a healthy CAF with a high potential for longevity in the herd. And above all, probably, um, we want something that's easy, right? We want it to, to, it might not be easy from a labor or a, an economic standpoint, but it will be easy from a, um, you know, we have a, a, a calf that's, that's well-grown um, and is ready to be a productive member of the herd. Then when we shift and we think about the calf, so this is a, a individually housed calf at a grower in Wisconsin. So what does this calf want? Um, this calf probably wants to be healthy and growing well, uh, and so if we think about, you know, growing well, that translates into to lots of milk, um, good health throughout the pre-weaning period. They want to be social, and so this is a really cool study out of the University of British Columbia that, that came out in, in January or February, where they did a study and they found that calves would actually prefer and actually work for access to a social companion. So calves really crave um, the socialization early in life. And then, of course, they want to be free from fear, distress, and pain. And then, if you bear with me, they want to be happy, right? If we kind of think about all these things together, um, we want a calf program that is easy for the producer and results in a, in a happy calf. And so when we think about our calf housing programs or calf housing, um, the, the, the management that we could be using, um, we're going to kind of go through in the next couple of slides of what are the pros and cons when we think about it from the producer perspective and the calf perspective of these different rearing systems. And so we're going to start with individual housing. So when we think about from the producer perspective, so the, the pros are here that we, we provide individual attention to the calf. So we're, you know, we're feeding these calves two or three times per day. We're walking by them. We're able to really look at them. Um, and we, we have improved health um, during the, or we have the ability to have good health during the pre-weaning period. Um, you know, especially when we have the hutches separated from one another, we have isolation kind of of those calves in those systems. The big cons here is that it's pretty labor inefficient, especially when we start comparing to, to group housing. And then we run into this issue where certainly we have potentially improved health during the pre-weaning period, but then when we move those calves, um, particularly if we're moving them as, as is common into fairly large groups, so we're talking like 30 to 40 calves in the post-weaning pen, we can run into some health challenges there. So when we think about it from the calf perspective, um, you know, again, calves stay relatively healthy in individual housing. They have a positive interaction with humans, so humans are associated with feeding, um, and, and so that's a pretty positive interaction. However, we just learned on the last slide that calves really prefer socialization, and so there's really no ability to have, you know, most of the time they have auditory and visual contact, um, but there's really no socialization prior to that lean pen um, movement. And so um, then, then, then in addition, there's no social buffering of a stressful situation. So um, there, there are kind of the pros and cons for the producer and the calf for individual housing. So if we move on to pair housing um, and we think about the producer, we really don't get, we really have sort of the same pros and cons um, as it relates to, to the producer um, as in individual housing with the um, added challenge of cross-sucking. However, when we think about the calf, um, you know, those calves, depending on when we're, when we're pairing them, and we're going to talk about, you know, age of pairing and when the best time to do that is, um, these calves are, are, are socialized. So um, particularly when we think about um, wean pen movement, these calves already know kind of how to be a social animal. Um, so, so that is a real pro for the calf. Um, there is, you know, potential for competition with their pair mate. There's um, potential for the, the cross-sucking to cause things like blind quarters um, downstream. So, um, so those are some of the cons for the calf. But in reality, individual housing and pair housing, we just gain that extra um, pro of socialization. So now we're going to move on to small groups. And really, you know, this is any... You can draw the line really wherever you want. Um, you know, this is a farm that they do groups of three to five, um, depending on when, when calves are born. Um, but really, when I think about small groups, I'm thinking about anything less than or equal to eight calves per group. 
And so, you know, from the producer standpoint, this is where we really start gaining that feeding labor efficiency. So, um, you know, and it, we can be mob feeding these calves um, and that really adds, you know, the, the feeding labor is really one of the biggest labor sucks um, when we think about, think about um, calf programs. So, um, however, you know, with the, the more calves we put in a group, the more likely we are to potentially have health challenges. And then, um, you know, there is the, we need to keep everything super clean. Um, so, so that can, can run into kind of the, uh, the, the labor piece as well. For the calf, um, she has increased milk allowance most of the time, um, ability to socialize. However, um, depending on how we're feeding those calves, um, we can run into cross sucking um, when we can have, you know, increased competition um, with, within a pen, especially if we're, we're mob feeding and calves really have to be vigorous um, in order to, to get their milk allowance. And then when we get to large groups, so this is you know anything greater than eight calves per group, but in reality, um, if we think about typical auto feeder herds, um, we're thinking anywhere between 20 and 25 calves per group. Um, so relatively large, large, um, large groups. This is a herd in New York that has ad lib acidified milk um, available. And so the real the real pro here is feeding labor efficiency. Um, we can run into challenge with disease detection. So sometimes these calves kind of get lost in the group. Um, potentially health treatment costs, especially if we're doing any sort of prophylactic or metaphylactic treatment. Um, and then for the for the calf, um, a lot of times we're, we can provide an increased milk allowance as calves can socialize. However, um, any of you who have worked in these systems, you have to have everything perfectly right, um, or um, we can run into challenges with, with um, increased morbidity and mortality. And then um, last but not least, I just want to mention cow-calf pairs. So um, this is something that's been done uh, more commonly, I think, on the on, on small farms um, on the organic side, but is uh, is something to think about at least. Um, so definitely we have feeder feeding labor efficiency here and, and consumer acceptability for sure. Um, however, uh, you know, the, the challenge becomes what do we do? How do we separate cows and calves? Um, do we run into these wild calves or essentially raising beef calves that, that aren't socialized to people? So how do we deal with that? Um, you know, seasonality and facilities are, are really big components here too. And then certainly for the calf, these, these calves, again, they look like beef calves, um, not like dairy calves. So they're, they're drinking a lot of milk. Um, they're socializing with the other calves. They're learning from, from their dam. Um, however, you know, we, we run into the challenge of very low human or potential, very low human animal interaction um, and potential stress at weaning. And so um, when we think about all these systems combined, um, this is this is what I, what I think. And this is where we're going. Right. So I think that when we think about the benefits to the producer, the benefits to the calf, any sort of social housing um, is, is really wins um, as compared to individual housing. And on top of that, we'll show you some data um, a little bit later in this presentation, but I think very pretty strongly that if social housing is not possible um, during the pre-weaning period, she, we should be finding ways to socialize calves um, prior to grouping at weaning. And that's particularly important when we think about the stress of weaning. We've, we have nutrition changes, um, we have environmental changes, and then we have social changes. And so if we can kind of take one of those away, take that social challenge away, um, we can run into um, some, some better health um, potentially in the, in the post wean pen. And so the, the other thing that I just wanted to stress um, before we start going into some of the research is this, is that um, when we, we think about making the switch from individual to social housing. Um, social housing exacerbates strain or problems or challenges already present within the system. So, um, you know, when we think about benchmarking, um, this is a really good um, idea to, to work with your veterinarian or your, your herd management team um, to think about where are we um, as far as, you know, these, these are just some parameters that we think about from a health standpoint. So failure, passive transfer, morbidity, mortality rates, growth rate. Um, you know, we, we need to be doing a good job before, before we make that switch because social housing um, can, can really uh, exacerbate those, those challenges that might already be there. Whereas individual housing, um, you might not have the same, um, the same risk. 
All right, and so I know that the, the title of this presentation is, is small group housing, um, but really, you know, scouring the literature, um, there's not a lot of, of literature out there that looks at small groups um, as compared to, say, individual. Um, and so we're going to talk mostly today about the literature that is in support of pair housing um, versus individual, but a lot of the concepts can, I think, probably be translated. We still probably need to, to have some, some good research looking at, you know, these small groups of, you know, three to five um, caps per group. But what does the research say in support of pair housing? So um, the first thing is that pair housing improves pre-weaning growth. And so um, this is, these are the results um, in this table here of four different studies and then some data from a commercial dairy that was uh, was working um, to, to investigate whether or not pair housing was feasible on their operation. And so um, here is the, these are the average daily gains in pounds per day um, between pair and individually housed calves, um, the difference in pounds per day, and then the peak milk offered. And I think it's really important to have that on there because um, this this is showing that no matter if we're feeding fairly high levels of milk, so nine liters of, of milk per day versus four liters um, of milk per day, which is pretty low feeding levels um, during the pre-weaning period, we still see that advantage, um, that 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 um, growth advantage in paired calves. And so that's that's pretty cool. So here's some some other information. So this is some some data from a study that we did here on in, at the University of Minnesota on our campus dairy. And um, I was really interested in following these calves um, to see what happened. I followed them to, to four months of age. And so, um, however, we took, we took body weights at weaning. And so this is um, just some, some weaning weights for you. Um, and so at, at weaning, we had an 18 pound difference in, uh, in body weight, an 18 pound advantage in the pair calves. And then that persisted, actually, we had a 17 pound advantage um, in those pair calves at 16 weeks. And, you know, this wasn't statistically significant because we have a lot more variation once calves kind of, or heifers, I guess, um, post wean calves have a little more um, leniency kind of in, in what they, what, what they have a less stringent feeding regimen, um, but we still have this advantage. So um, probably something is going on. And the thing that we think is going on is these calves, they're eating more starter. Um, and here's some evidence for that. So um, these paired calves have improved starter intake. And we don't know whether this is due to competition, social facilitation. You know, they, one calf sees another calf go, or the, in the pair, sees another calf go up um, and, and start eating. And they say, oh, I wonder what, wonder what that calf is doing and goes up and, and starts nibbling on the, on the starter as well. Um, but regardless, um, both during the pre-weaning period and post-weaning, paired calves have improved starter intake. And so here's the, these are two studies that show this. Um, and so in this study, these calves are feeding um, are getting fed ad lib milk, which is why these grain intakes are, are actually quite low um, during the pre weaning period because these calves are drinking a lot of milk. But regardless of that, um, the paired calves in this sort of gray line versus the dashed line um, at five and six weeks are eating much more starter as compared to those individually housed calves. So that's during the pre weaning period. And then if we look at that post weaning, um, so this is a you know, similar study where um, we had calves that are, that are drinking a little less milk, but the paired calves in this solid line um, at week eight and nine post weaning are eating much more green um, as compared to those individually housed calves. And so, um, you know, when we think about immune function, we think about, you know, the weaning transition, this is a pretty important finding that these calves are just, they're, they're eating more starter um, and they're, they're better able to handle that, that weaning transition. And then when we, talk, when we think more about that weaning transition, um, so we, in that same study um, that I described a couple slides ago, um, we put little, so four months, we we followed these um, calves for four months and we put little um, activity monitors on these calves. And so, um, and then measured basically we had activity, we had standing and line and steps basically from, you know, when they were born. So this is a, a, a newborn here um, in the, the maternity pen um, through the, the four month period. And what I was particularly interested in is understanding what happened at weaning. And so on this on this operation or at the campus dairy, um, they're weaned at about 50 days, and then they're moved from their their either individual or pair housed situation about a quarter mile down the road 
um, to a, um, a, a pen, a wean cast pen. And so um, the, the question was, what happened when those calves were moved? Um, and, and how did that affect their, their line or their resting time? And so what we did is we were able, because we had sort of the, we had video on these calves, and so we had the exact moment um, when they entered that pen. So we were able to look seven days, you know, in like sort of 24 hour increments, we were able to look seven days before and seven days after on that movement to that lean calf pen. Um, and what you can see here is in the seven days prior to wean pen entry, these calves are pretty much doing the same thing, not a lot of difference here. They're laying down and resting about 18 hours per day. Um, and then on the day that they move to that wean calf pen, um, there's a big difference here. So all the calves decrease um, in their, their line time, but the difference here um, in the, the individual, previously individually housed calves versus the pair housed calves was 14%. Was so on the day that they were moved, um, the, the previously paired calves laid down um, for, for more than three hours more on that day as compared to the individually housed calves. And that persisted um, for six days post wean pen movement. Um, and so because we had video, we were able to ask the question, what are these calves doing? Um, and so we looked specifically at the six hours after wean pen entry. Um, we were we had the challenge of this. This is a winter study, so we, we didn't have a lot of daylight to work with um, here in Minnesota. And then we looked at um, increments um, on day two and day three um, post post wean pen movement. And um, what we found was pretty interesting. Um, and here's just an example of that. So um, pair calves were less reactive and more socially adjusted post wean pen movement. And how did we decide that? Um, here's one example. So um, we developed a, a list of behaviors and we, we watched these calves um, to the, whether or not they expressed these behaviors. And this is one of the things that we found was that um, the previously paired calves um, ran around less. So this is self-locomotor play, which basically means the calves are running around the pen by themselves um, rather than running around the pen, you know, all the calves are running around the pen together. Um, and we found that in the first hour after pen entry, those individual calves ran around a, a lot more um, than those pair house calves. And they all decreased, um, and then we lose you know, our, our difference here. Um, but in that first hour, there's a lot of disruption in that, in that pen um, if you're an individually housed calf. And then the other thing that we looked at um, was social adjustment. So this is something that's really hard to measure um, but we, we used social grooming, so um, whether or not those calves are, are grooming each other as kind of a proxy for how socially adjusted these calves were in the pen. Um, and we found that um, pair calves were observed to be socially grooming 14% of the time, whereas the individually calves only 3%. So, um, you know, this is just one example out of the many, um, many things that we measured of these, these pair calves being less reactive and more socially adjusted. And so what does this actually look like? So here's a video. So um, unfortunately, these we couldn't move all the calves at once. So we kind of had the calves kind of trickled into the pen. Um, but these calves were all moved on the same day. And um, this, this video is from 24 hours after they entered that pen. And um, if I, if I had you all in person, I would say which which side were the previously paired calves and which side were the previously individually housed calves. And hopefully everyone would say, ah, the calves on the left hand side that are just hanging out, the what that wife calf is chewing her cud. Those are probably the individually or the pair house calves. And the calves on the right who are up and moving around, running around, vocalizing, exploring their environment. Um, those are the previously individually housed calves. And so um, unfortunately, they, they go out of, out of shot here, um, but you can see they're, they're more a little agitated. Um, they're interacting with each other. They're interacting with their environment. Um, they're, a little bit ago, you could have seen a vocalization. Um, they're kind of, you know, trying to figure it out, uh, whereas those calves on the left-hand side are just hanging out uh, pretty peacefully. There's a, there's a vocalization. All right, 
The other question um, that people have when it comes to paired calves as, it, as compared to individual um, is this issue or this question of health. And so um, we, and um, the vast majority of studies that are published are done in you know, small, pretty small studies done in university herds. And so to really get a sense of, of morbidity and mortality, so looking at the diarrhea and, and, um, and respiratory disease and, and risk of death, you really need to have big studies. And so um, we are in the process of finishing up data collection on a pretty big trial um, where we looked at um, individually housed calves versus triplets. Um, and so the reason that this particular operation wanted to look at triplets is they, they move hutches. So this is a, a hutch study. Um, they, they move hutches in groups of three and that's how they, they move them. That's how they wash them. Um, and so it made a lot of sense to them um, to, to do triplets rather than try to do pairs um, from, a, from a logistics and a, a labor standpoint. And so um, we had the opportunity to collect a bunch of, of data. Um, and so what we found, so we had we had actually four groups, but the, what I'm gonna um, share with you are, are two of the groups um, and the comparison between the two. And so one um, group was calves that were um, individually housed, and then the other is, is calves that were housed with so three calves in a, in a triple um, or a triplet. So three hutches, um, three calves. And so what we found is that pre-weaning, there isn't really a lot of difference between those groups. So between individual um, and, and what you would call small group, right, a triplet, um, three calves, in the, the pneumonia treatments, in diarrhea treatments, or in the risk of death. However, we did find very interestingly um, that when, so the, the way that the management works on this particular operation is that they are on milk for 60 days, they are, um, then they're weaned, they are kept in their, in their housing that, you know, whether the triplet, so this is an example of the triplet with um, these would be removed, so all three of these calves can interact with each other, and this is an individual calf. Um, they're, they're in those, they stay in that housing then um, post weaning for 30 days. And then from there, they move uh, in groups to another site, uh, groups of 36. And so um, what then we were able to measure all kinds of things, but we were particularly interested in the risk of pneumonia treatment um, in the 30 days um, and 60 days post wean pen movement. And what we found, um, or, or what we found so far, is that um, calves that were housed in a triplet have a lower risk of treatment for pneumonia as compared to calves that were previously individually housed. And so, you know, a difference in treatment rates between about 8% and 11.2%. Um, and so I, I would also, you know, 57 calves versus 90, um, you also look at the denominators here. So we have quite a few calves, um, so almost 600 uh, versus 800 in these groups. And so, you know, we're getting to the point where we can actually probably say something, um, at least on this operation, um, as it relates to, to this health post weaning. And again, this is really why I'm a big proponent of socializing calves prior to, to weaning, um, because something is going on, whether that's, you know, their immune function is better because they've had to, um, you know, have a more robust immune system because there's three of them that are interacting versus one. Um, or if it has to do something with they're already socialized and they know how to be a social creature, so their stress levels are less, um, their, you know, their cortisol, we know that cortisol impacts immune function, um, so we really don't know, and we actually, we just got some funding to, to look at that question a little, a little um, cl more closely, um, but it seems that, um, you know, something is going on in the calf when they're housed, um, you know, in a triplet at least, that is helping them um, reduce their risk of pneumonia or treatment for pneumonia when they go to that post weaning pen. So still, still ongoing work um, and a, an area of active research interest for me. All right, so that's kind of what we know. Um, again, the pair versus individual housing. So um, now we're gonna move on to talk about best management practices for pair housing. So um, the first one here that calves should be paired sometime in the first three weeks. So, um, and uh, this is 
not really been studied in, in pair house calves as to how many days in between, but we know when we think about um, group housing, so um, there have been a handful of studies that it look, have looked at um, you know, the age difference in calves in a pen. Um, and it seems that you don't, if, once you get more than 14 days, that's when the risk um, of, of abnormal health events or abnormal health scores increases. So um, ideally, no more than, than 14 days between calves in a pair. Um, so why, why this, um, this first three weeks? Where does this number come from? So this is mostly due um, to starter intake and then um, subsequent growth. And so it looks like that something is happening in that, that first three weeks that is um, helping those calves learn to eat starter um, and thus have an increased um, average daily gain. So this is a study that was done um, in 2015 at the, um, at the University of British Columbia and their animal welfare group. And they asked the question, um, you know, does age at pairing matter as it relates to starter intake? And so um, in this, um, schematic. So they only started measuring it about four weeks, as we know that calves really don't eat a lot of grain, especially if they're being fed high quantities of milk. Um, and then we, um, you know, we had one group that was paired at 42 days, so they're getting paired here. Um, and then weaning happened at this red arrow at eight weeks. And you can see um, that the calves that were in the early pair, paired at six days of age, um, increased their starter intake um, more as compared to calves that were in that late pair. So that's this dotted, the small dotted line. Um, and then the individual calves are in the kind of um, bigger dots with the, with the square. Um, and so that also in this study, it translated to a higher average daily gain, which makes sense. So they're eating more starter, their average daily gain is, is higher over those 10 weeks. And so that's six days versus 42. Um, another recent study, asked a different question, but their, their question was birth versus three weeks um, versus individual. And the same idea here where they're measuring starter intake, they're averaging it per week. And um, you know, here the individual, when we get to eight weeks, um, the individual calves are um, eating much less starter than um, the calves that are, that are paired either at three weeks or at birth. And so um, I didn't include it here, but we did a study um, where we asked the, we, we were asked the question um, zero versus 30 days. And I will tell you that in that study, we saw no difference um, or no advantage um, to, to pairing um, at, at 30 days versus, versus zero. So there seems to be something sort of magical in those first three weeks that is helping um, improve that starter intake. So um, this, so this, two calves, two hutches. So, um, and this is mostly based on um, experience. So we know that the, the DCHA guidelines recommend 35 square feet of resting space per calf. And we know um, when looking at some of the, the group housing data that um, more space is better, more resting space. So between 45 and 50 square feet of resting space per calf is needed when we get up into the larger groups. And that, uh, that's associated with reduced risk of abnormal health scores. Um, and so, however, I was actually at a farm yesterday, um, a, a heifer grower that is um, pairing calves in one hutch. And I asked um, this producer, how do you like it? And they said, that seems to be going well. Um, and they've, they've been doing it in one hutch. So um, I think that this is an, and, and now that we have um, some of the, you know, um, the, the companies are coming out with these sort of extra large hutches that are specifically um, for pair housing. I think we need to, to double down on this question um, a little bit more of, you know, do we really need two hutches? Do we do what, what's, what's the square footage we need? Um, you know, maybe it's seasonal, you know, maybe in the summertime we need you know, more outdoor space. Um, so this question about how much space do these calves need, um, I think is still um, is still not answered. However, um, we do know um, that, you know, Holstein calves, by the time they're weaned, um, especially if we're doubling body weight, if we're feeding enough milk, um, you know, these calves can be up, you know, 200 pounds. And so if we have two 200 pound calves in the space of one, you know, in 35 square feet, it's probably not enough space. So um, particularly when these calves, these are two photos of some of my study calves, they hang out together. Um, so after the first maybe week of life, um, they start hanging out together in the same hutch. 
And so, you know, that's between 60 and 80 percent of their time is, is spent together. Um, and so we don't still know a lot about like which hutch they prefer and what are the factors that influence that. Um, but regardless, the current recommendations, um, two calves, two hutches, or um, two calves in, in a barn, um, two spaces. So if you, you know, removing that center panel, and I'll show you some pictures um, in, a, in a few slides of that. So cross sucking. So this, you know, this is an example of cross sucking. So this calf here has a full bottle over here, um, but she is more interested in, um, you know, doing some cross sucking. And so what that, what the definition of that is, is, you know, sucking on any part of the calf. And it becomes particularly problematic um, when we have calves that are that are sucking on other calves' navels or prep uses um, or their udders um, as they as they sort of progress. And so. Um, However, we know a couple things and we know, um, you know, we have some, some tools in the toolbox to how to prevent this behavior. And so this is a schematic um, we did in that same study where we asked um, zero versus 30 days um, at pairing. Um, we also did some, some behavioral observations um, and, and this is a really cool thing. So this is um, time from milk feeding um, with zero being, and the, this red arrow being milk feeding time. And then we basically, I had my student every two minutes walk past all the calves and write down what they were doing. Um, and so, which is, a, it's a really cool way um, to collect some good data. And so um, this, is a, this is a graphic of um, cross-sucking events. So this is just number of observations. And you can see that um, before milk feeding, there's very little cross-sucking that happens. Um, however, after milk feeding, um, you know, we have a lot of cross-sucking and the majority of it is happening in those first 10 to 14 minutes um, after milk is being fed. And so if we can figure out a way to occupy those calves um, for that time, we can probably reduce our risk of cross-sucking. And so there's a couple different strategies that we can use um, to, to try to do that. So how do we do that? Um, the first is to feed a high milk allowance. And so, um, you know, in, in any calf, we should be feeding at least 1.8 pounds of dry matter um, per day. Um, Jersey's, Holstein's, doesn't matter. Um, and then if we, we get up into the, you know, the, the, the Holstein's, um, you know, we want to be prioritizing, you know, 2.1 pounds of dry matter um, per, per day for those calves. Um, the other thing is that a high milk allowance, um, particularly with, when, with regard to cross sucking, if we can keep those calves occupied um, and, and nursing, um, that will reduce their desire to go and cross suck. Um, there, there is a really great study from the University of Wisconsin where they investigate um, the difference between the a calf that's being fed with one of the, the slow flow teats um, versus drinking out of a bucket. And it's a gallon of milk that they're feeding per feeding time. Um, and they found that the, the slow flow teat increased the time that calf was suckling from two minutes. So two minutes to, to drink milk out of a bucket versus eight minutes um, to drink out of one of those slow, slow flow teats. Um, and, and they found that that reduced the risk um, of cross sucking. So if we're keeping those cans occupied, we're fulfilling that natural, um, natural desire to nurse um, and to suckle. Um, we can reduce our risk of cross sucking. The second thing we can do um, is feed through through a nipple or a nipple bucket or a nipple bottle. So again, we think about you know the calf's desire to to suckle, um, providing milk through um, some sort of a bucket or bottle that has the nipple associated with it is uh, is a nice way again to to help them fulfill that behavior. And then um, the other thing is providing a barrier between calves. And so there's the, here's two examples of that. Um, so on the, the left side here, these two calves, so um, you can't see it super well, um, but there is a piece of hog paneling that is um, between these two calves that doesn't go the whole way, so these calves can still interact. Um, but at feeding time, um, what they do on this particular operation is they put a piece of, P, at least for the first couple of weeks, um, they put a, a PVC pipe um, behind these calves to kind of put them in a, a stall, if you will. Um, and then, you know, that, that keeps them here with the bottle and they can continue to nurse off that bottle once they finish their milk meal um, so they don't start suckling on each other. So that's if you're, if you're using, and, and we know there's good, there's good uh, 
uh, evidence in the literature to suggest that a one meter, so a three foot barrier, um, will prevent cross sucking and will prevent milk switching and milk stealing um, in, in calves that are fed or that are housed together. Um, so barrier is good. And then this is a, a example of, so a lot of farms in Minnesota, upper Midwest still feed milk in buckets. Um, and again, those calves can really drink that milk really fast. And so um, to keep them separate in their separate hutches, um, this is something that we did on the campus dairy is we, we separated them at milk feeding time. And so the, the, the calf feeders would come through, they would separate the calves, um, they would come through and they feed milk, they come through and do starter and water um, because we don't offer water all the time here because it freezes and so we offer it at specific times throughout the day. Um, and then they would open this back up. So the calves had access to themselves pretty much all the time except for around milk feeding time. And in this study, um, we actually, we were looking at for cross sucking. Um, we were looking very hard for cross sucking and we did not see any when calves were separated in this way. Um, so, so feeding in buckets, you can do it. Of course that adds extra labor, um, but it, that's an option um, for, for preventing or, or eliminating cross sucking. All right, and then, you know, last but not least, um, each calf should have their own starter and, and water bucket, especially if we think about, you know, why are these calves, um, you know, eating more starter? They're probably eating more starter because they're facilitating each other to do that. And so we don't want to limit them by only offering one, one bucket. Um, we want to offer them, you know, multiple opportunities um, to, to, to drink water and to eat starter. And then, you know, just finishing up with some sort of pictures and options um, for what this could look like. So again, um, you know, this can be, you know, three hutches together, four hutches together. You know, we, we don't really know, again, what is the magic number? Um, we don't know a lot about, um, about small groups. We do know a lot about, about pairing. Um, and so these are, these are kind of two similar systems. So this is what we do on the campus dairy where we have our hutches and then we have a, a plastic piece in between. Um, the reason for this is that these calves are getting um, starter and water from the side of the hutch. So in theory, you can just kind of push those hutches right next to each other. Um, but this is what is, is allowing humans to go in there and then keeping the calves from jumping out. Um, same idea here. This is a system um, that is they're feeding at libidum um, uh, from a study that was done um, in Canada. And, um, you know, similar setup with sort of hog wire um, around, giving the, the calves some outdoor and, and their hutch space. And then I think, you know, this is my least favorite sort of system for housing calves in hutches in a pair. This is sort of the front facing system. So the idea here is that we set up gates um, we set up a, a gate in the middle here, and um, we, you know, have have the opportunity for calves kind of in each hutch. Um, I don't like it because you to look at calves, you know, we don't know which hutch they're going to prefer, um, and so you have to sort of weave in and out of them to to observe all the calves every day. And um, in all these other systems, we can facilitate some sort of drive by or walk by. Um, feeding, whereas in this situation, um, it's not as easy to do. So um, can can do it in that way, but um, preferably putting putting hutches sort of together in a row. And then you know here's some options: pair housing in barns. So. Um, Really, these are all the same, pretty much the same. Um, most of these um, systems, particularly with indoor housed calves or calves housed in barns, um, we have some sort of way or some sort of divider between them. So that's this. These are calves that are housed in a pair. There's a divider that was pulled out. Um, same here, here, here. Um, and this is just an example. It's very common um, in. So I come from Pennsylvania, um, and this is a picture on a dairy in, in PA. And they actually, it's almost like the California style hutches where they have three calves kind of in a, in a space. Um, and so again, like we can make a triple here, but the, the, what the, the point is here is that we can remove these center dividers um, and, and, um, and make a, a small group. All right, so just to, to reiterate here, our summary and best practices, repair housing, um, which relate to um, small groups as well. So the first thing is that, you know, we need to be do, already doing a good job with our calves. 
um, pairing or grouping sometime within the first uh, three weeks of life. And I didn't mention it, but some, some um, producers have found success in um, keeping the, you know, even if you have the, the pair formed and the, the pair hutch, um, keeping those calves separated for the first seven days of life, um, you know, pick a number that's kind of sort of just a, a pick from air number. Um, but that allows those calves to kind of learn how to be a calf um, and learn, you know, become a vigorous drinker um, before, before you form that pair. So again, at least 35 square feet of resting space per calf. That's the current recommendation. I think that deserves um, a little bit more investigation by researchers like me. Um, Cross-sucking mitigation. So a couple of things that we can do here, provide at least six liters um, of milk per day or whatever the equivalent of 1.8 um, pounds of dry matter in you know, high quality milk or milk replacer. Feed that milk through a teat bucket or bottle. Um, again, that will promote natural sucking um, and, and hopefully reduce cross sucking. And then adding a barrier um, in between calves, whether that's um, a barrier at milk feeding time or a barrier that is always there um, that, that is at least one meter long. And then one water and starter bucket per calf. And so again, I'm just gonna bring it back to um, thinking about small groups. So I think a lot of these principles translate. Um, and I know, you know, from a labor standpoint, um, there is a lot of value in, you know, putting calves in a small group and, uh, and mob feeding them. Um, and so I think we, we still need probably some more um, producer experience and also um, some, some more studies to, to look at, you know, what advantages, disadvantages, um, you know, what the best number of calves are. There's really a, a lot to learn um, when we think about this. But the, the reality is when we look at the, the studies that compare um, small groups to large groups, um, small groups always went out when we talk of, from a health, um, a health and performance stand, or health, a health standpoint. And I'll just leave you with this. Um, so, you know, social housing is the future of calf housing. So, um, you know, we need to be willing to be flexible, work with producers, um, you know, producers, please work with, with veterinarians um, who, who wanna work with you um, to, to help um, help you, um, particularly if you're, if you're a producer who is interested in um, switching. Um, there's a lot of, of great experience that, that people have. Um, there have been a lot of people who have been kind of early adopters, if you will, who have been kind of, um, you know, playing around with some of these different methods. Um, so, but I think if we think about, you know, what's best for the, for the calf, for sure, um, and for the producer as well, um, you know, individual housing is, is not it. Um, and so, you know, stay tuned for, for more information in the future. Um, again, this is something that I'm actively um, researching. Uh, and so um, we'll, we'll have more, more data as we, as we move forward um, with, these, with these changes in, in how we manage our calves. And so I would like um, to thank you um, and thank, thank Hordes uh, for inviting me to, to talk with you all today. And uh, I look forward um, to, to the discussion that follows. Thank you very much, Dr. Knauer, for that presentation. Um, we really appreciate you sharing some of your research and then some of the industry information that's out there in regard to housing calves in pairs and small groups. Also, I'd like to thank Agroplastic one, Plastics once again for their sponsorship of this webinar. If you would like to view this webinar again, it will be available online on our HORDS website later this week. You can find it there along with all of our past webinars, which are archived on the webinar page of the Hordes.com website. If you'll click ahead one link, Dr. Knauer, there you go. Um, we would like to invite you to our future webinars. Um, these webinars take place every month, the second Monday at noon central time. In August, we will have a presentation by John Gazer from Rock River Laboratory titled Making the Most of This Year's Corn Silage. So he'll really be looking at the growing corn crop and making plans for harvest and how to produce the best feed possible. Then in September, we'll have a presentation by Barry Bradford of Michigan State University. He'll be talking about inflammation um, in animals, especially around the time of calving and whether that's a problem or um, a good thing for our cows. So please make plans to attend both of these webinars if you are interested in these topics. 
Now, we did have some questions that came in during the presentation, um, Dr. Knauer. So if I will ask you those. Some of these might be just reiterating some of the information that you have shared. But um, the first one here is a question that is um, in regard to that present or to that research that you did that had the unpublished data. And this person is wondering if you measured any of the stress variables that took place between the two groups, the individual house versus the calves that were in pairs. Um, any comments there? Sure. So, um, great question. Um, so, in the the study that I mentioned with the the calves that we um, with the calves on campus, um, so we had 12 calves per group, and the intention was to do some cortisol measurements. Um, we were we were particularly interested in um, measuring hair cortisol, and so that is kind of uh, the the accumulation of cortisol in the calves or cows or whatever species um, life from the time that you you take the hair to the next to the time that it grows again. Um, and so we did do, unfortunately, I underestimated how fast um, half, calf hair grows. Um, and it didn't, the intention was to, to take that hair cortisol measure at multiple points throughout the those four, four months of observation. Um, and it didn't grow back. And so we only had um, at birth, which it was, it's high um, because calves in utero, um, there's lots of stress that happens in utero. And so it was pretty high. Um, and then it came down at, at four months, but there was no difference between groups. Um, we are planning a study um, to get at the, um, the stress as it relates to weaning and social mixing. So that study, um, the data will be, will be collected this, this fall and winter. Um, and so we're particularly interested in the weaning. So I'm um, looking at, looking at um, cortisol measures um, around the time of weaning, because we know from a lot from other studies that, um, you know, things like, uh, we, which is sort of a proxy for stress, which is vocalization. Um, vocalization is actually reduced in calves that are housed in a pair around the time of weaning. So there's something going on there with social buffering. Um, and then we're going to also measure it um, at mixing. So, um, so same, same idea there that we're, we're anticipating or the hypothesis there is that um, the, the cortisol levels in the paired calves will be lower um, because they're, they're better able to, to cope with those changes. So um, great question and um, future area uh, of investigation. Definitely another area to stay tuned on. Uh, next question, if you could revisit growth of calves but from individuals versus paired housing, someone's wondering about the average daily gain difference between individual versus paired house calves. Sure. So um, the literature suggests that anywhere between 0.3 and 0.4 pounds per day um, in, you know, the, the university trials that we have, um, we are so, so that, you know, is a pretty controlled environment. Um, you know, most universities are feeding or, or the, the research farms are, are feeding pretty high levels of milk um, and so and, and are, are also pretty healthy. Um, and so we we also have some data from um, from commercial dairies. Um, and we are we we did measure um, body weight, you know, birth weight, wean weight, at um, for that triplet study. Um, have not looked at that data yet, um, but as far as I remember, there wasn't a lot of difference. And so um, I think there's there's a, the challenge is to extrapolate that, you know, 0.3 to 0.4 pounds of gain per day, and to apply it to a commercial dairy that has a lot of other potential challenges. Um, you know real world sort of sort of things. So again, um, 0.3 to 0.4 pounds um, in university your university trials, but um, not a lot of data on, on real real operations. Okay. Commercial operations. You you talked um, quite a bit about cross sucking and ways to prevent it to both avoid milk stealing and um, sucking on calves and causing potential udder damage and things. Um, what about cross sucking's risk on disease transfer? And um, I guess just what are your thoughts maybe on spreading disease between calves that are housed together and have that nose to nose contact? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great question. Um, I. I don't know the answer. So I know that there is, I know of, this is anecdotal. Um, there's one herd um, who, the herd in um, somewhere in Wisconsin where they're, they've got group group housing, um, large groups, and they see cross-sucking, you know, 
there's cross sucking in, in, in group house calves. It's just a thing that happens. Um, no matter how, how well you try to mitigate it, um, you know, there's always going to be that calf that does it. Um, and they've actually found that, or they've, they've cultured um, pasturella out of the udders of, of animals calving in with, with mastitis. So um, there's, there's a, a, a way um, that that could happen. I don't, you know, as, as far as risk, um, you know, cross sucking being a, a bigger risk as it relates to like transfer of diarrheal or respiratory disease. Um, I, I don't think that that, that's not to me the biggest risk. To me, the bigger risk is um, you know, maybe navel infections, you know, if, if we're, if we're sucking on, on the navels of, of our neighbors, um, or, you know, that post, that, um, post wean calves suckling on each other, and then that translating to either blind quarters or heifer mastitis. And um, that would be my, my bigger area of concern, but those are mostly just associations. I don't know that we have, um, the data to say that this calf suckled on this calf and there that animal, you know, developed heifer mastitis. Like, I just don't think um, we have that that data to, to support that. Very good. Um, any further thoughts on the impact of early life socialization on brain development and immune function? Oh, great question. Um, no, but it's it's. I do think about it. Um, I, I think that that's a a very interesting area of research to to ask this question about early life experiences and how how that impacts the the animal later on. Um, and, and I know that there are people who are at least engaged in thinking about that. Um, I don't know if anyone is actively um, investigating. I will say though that you know from a from a socialization standpoint, I do think they're really, and, and so I mentioned that study where we're measuring cortisol, we're also gonna measure um, immune function and nasal microbiome development. And so um, as it relates to, you know, the stressful um, stressful events in a, in, a, in a calf's life, which are weaning and post wean pen movement. So, you know, maybe in, in two years, I'll have a, a different or better answer. Um, but there's just something I think about that socialization that sets them up um, for, you know, more success um, as compared to, to camps that are not allowed um, that socialization during the pre-weaning period. Right. It's some of this, some of this is hard to measure, how hard to keep track of, but I mean, we certainly hear of either anecdotal stories or some research where calves that are group house or pair house seem to just be smarter where they, they eat started yeah. earlier, eat more of it. And there seems to be some benefits there. And he said, well, hopefully keep learning um, how this might impact calves and then cows once they enter the lactating herd. Yeah, absolutely. What are your opinions on a milk bar for calves or like the different kinds of feeding options that are available if you are going to group house? Yeah, great question. So um, best practice, if you're going to use a milk bar, is to have 10% um, more teats than calves. Um, so, you know, at least an extra teat per, per calf. I would say that the, the ones that I like um, are the ones that have the ability to like, not, not where you just dump milk in and you, you can't tell, but there are some that have like compartments that are associated with each teat. And so I think for me, from a like making sure that every calf is getting her milk allowance standpoint, um, I like that system better. Um, I, I do know some organic producers that just keep dumping milk in until the calves get tired of drinking and then go lay down. Um, but that's a pretty, I mean, that's a pretty expensive way to, to feed calves. Um, but those calves certainly don't cross up. So I guess, um, you know, 10% more milk than calves, um, or sorry, 10% more teats than calves um, in the pen. Um, ideally having a way to measure intakes. Um, and I think one of the big challenges is making sure that you're, you're cleaning them appropriately. Um, you know, going through the same essential, you know, wash cycle as you would your parlor, you know, with detergent and acid um, and making sure they stay clean. Um, but otherwise, you know, I think that as, as long as the sort of best practices are, are adhered to, um, you know, different different milk bars can can work. Um, along those same lines, someone is asking about a correlation between cross sucking and feeding intervals and volume. So I don't know if you have some you know, best practices you want to 
um, share with the group again about how much cash should be fed and maybe how often to help prevent cross suckling. That's a that's a great question. Um, and I'm not, you know, I, in an ideal world, um, if we had free labor, you know, and, and we thought about the behavior of the calf and what the calf wants, you know, she probably wants to drink five to eight times per day. Um, you know, that's what she, that's what a beef calf would do, right? Depending on age. Um, however, you know, if we're thinking like three, three times a day versus two times a day, um, you know, and then we sort of compound that with how much milk we're feeding. Um, you, you know, I'm not sure that I have good recommendations as it relates to, to cross sucking. You know, I'm not sure that I've seen, um, you know, as, as compared, so however, you know, ad libitum feeding, so, you know, those, the acidified milk herds that, you know, basically just have a teat and a line of milk running where the calves can go up and drink whatever they want. Um, you know, they're probably, they're less likely to cross suck. Um, but the, the challenge there comes in is when we wean them, um, you know, we're, we're basically like, it's a shock to their system. Um, their little, little calf brains, um, you know, don't, don't do so well if we're not, if we're going to abruptly wean them. So that, that becomes a challenge as well is how are we going to wean them or we need to wean them over a long period of time. So coming back to the initial, the original question, like, I'm not sure that I have a good recommendation, um, other to say that, you know, feeding probably, you know, at least twice a day, if not three times a day, um, and then feeding, you know, you know, three, three, at least if we're three and three X, um, you know, three quarts or three liters per feeding, if we're feeding two X, you know, a gallon per feeding, you know, make those calves full and satiated. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, here we have a person that says they love the idea of pair housing and they've tried it with a few um, groups of calves over the years, but typically resulted in cross sucking. Their calves are housed indoors and are bucket fed and converting to bottles really isn't an option for them or a desire. Um, that being said, do you have any knowledge or no studies for farms that are using like a calf pacifier, um, some kind of dummy nipple for calves to spend some time um, with instead of sucking on each other? Any, any thoughts there? Yeah, great, that's a good question. I, um, there is, there have been studies, yes, that have looked at like adding adding a nipple um, to the pen. Um, and I can't, like those study, those are things that I've read a, a while ago, so I can't, you know, quote them exactly. But, um, you know, giving the calf the option to do that um, will reduce the risk um, of them suckling on each other. Um, I would say like the, so if you're, if the, the option is to feed in a, in a bucket only, um, and, and it's, you're able to, um, you know, separate them in milk feeding time. So in the studies that we've done, and it depends on how you do it, but in the studies that we've done, it takes about a minute per pair per day, um, sorry, a minute per pair for feeding. So about two minutes extra labor um, to actually separate them. Um, but, you know, as long as you keep them separate for long enough, you know, for that post milk consumption, you know, 12 to 15 minutes um, so that they, you know, get over their desire to, to suckle, um, that can reduce and or eliminate um, the, the cross segment that you see. So, um, I, you know, I would, I would encourage you to, to, you know, maybe try a nipple, but also, um, you know, if, if you can, from a labor standpoint, um, play around with separating them um, and see, see how that works for you. Okay, and here we have an interesting comment. Um, this is a, a listener who is tuning in from Colombia. He mm. says, or she says, said that we raise calves in groups outdoors all year long. And what mm. they've noticed is that these groups remain together for the rest of their lives. So an, interesting that that early life impact may provide a lifelong companionship for those animals. I don't know if you've heard anything similar to that, Dr. Knauer. No, but that's a that's a really cool observation. Um, you know, and the, this idea of like cow friendships and you know these these social these, these important social networks. Um, it, that's a really interesting thing to me. So th thank you um, for sharing that. And back back to cross sucking. Um, Again, obviously this is something that's top of mind for a lot of people. Do you have any recommendations for calves after weaning, how to prevent during that transition period and prevent calves from sucking on each other? Yeah, great. This, these are all great questions um, and, and questions that come up a lot. So I haven't seen any data on this um, and you should probably just do the study, but 
I have heard veterinarians and producers talk about providing pay, some sort of forage um, for calves in that weaning transition um, to give them something to do. So, um, or, or, you know, we, I really hesitate to, to you know, feed calves um, much forage um, because they prefer it and then they run in, you know, they don't develop the rumen. So you have to do it very carefully. Um, but I have heard people say that if we give them, you know, just include a little bit of hay, like high quality, you know, nice alfalfa um, that has high protein um, that can, you know, occupy the calves and give them something to do um, rather than, than suckling on, on each other. You know, another thing, and I, this, it's, it's, it's what, I don't like putting band-aids on problems. I like finding the root of the problem and then addressing that. Um, but I've also heard, you know, some, again, this is, I, I did a webinar for um, Organic Valley and some of the organic producers, they just have these, like, they're so willing to do, um, do things and, you know, have some really great ideas. And one of the things that one of the producers said is they just put on, um, I don't know if, if everyone is familiar with the the weaning ring nose rings um but they use them in the beef cow world where they're like nose flaps um and so they prevent they, they do that to mitigate the stress of weaning from the cow um and so they put the nose flaps on so the the calf can stay with the cow while it's it's not drinking um and so that you know some produ some producers just do that as they put either nose flaps or nose rings in every calf um and then you know then they that that prevents the behavior as well so i i, I don't know that i would promote that um, as, as like a good option, because I think, you know, getting back to the root of why the calves are cross suckling to begin with um, is important, but those are, those are just two potential options um, that, you know, anecd again, anecdotally, um, I've, I've heard um, people talk about. All right, and here's our last question, an interesting one. Um, do you, from any of your studies or any that you've come across, have there been any differences discovered between the different breeds in regard to these different housing models and or feeding strategies? Anything that you're aware of? Great question. Um, the the answer to that, like, the, I don't think any study has looked at like the difference between Holstein and Jerseys, right? When it comes to to pair housing or group housing, um, I think we can sort of take the character, the temperament of those animals, and extrapolate a little bit. Um, but I, I don't think that that there is like a like that that Holsteins are you know better suited for social housing as compared to Jerseys or anything like that. Like I don't I don't I don't think that that's true, and I certainly haven't seen that work. Um, I will say though, when um, I just some, not something I talked about, but um, when thinking about size differences in a pair or in a group. Um, and that's something that people worry about is the, you know, a smaller calf, if you put a, you know, for example, a jersey with, you know, a newborn jersey with a newborn Holstein, they, they might have a, a 30 pound size difference. Um, and so people worry about bullying um, in, in those situations. And I will say that I have N of two, um, two pairs where the one of the pair mates was, um, you know, 50 or 60 pounds and the other one was, was 90 or 100 pounds when they were paired. Um, and both those animals did, did, did great. Um, one of the, the little 50 pounder tripled her body weight um, by weaning. So um, she was, I think she was just a little quirky. So um, she did a really good job. But um, yeah, getting back to the, the original question, breed differences. Um, no, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen anything that looks at or talks about um, different differences as it relates to, to social housing. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Knauer, for addressing all those questions and kind of recovering some of those topics. We really appreciate you taking the time to be part of our webinar series and delivering this presentation today. We hope that all of our listeners enjoyed the conversation and we would encourage you to um, tune into one of our future webinars. If you wanna click ahead one slide, Dr. Knauer, thank you. Again, our next webinar will take place on August 8th. We'll be talking about the corn silage and the upcoming harvest. And then in September, we'll be talking about inflammation in cows, um, and that presentation will be sponsored by ONT Farms. And we would like to thank Agroplastics for sponsoring this webinar. And we really appreciate their support. If you can click ahead one more time. And we really appreciate them being a part of our webinar series. And thank you again, Dr. Knauer, for sharing this information on housing calves and in small groups and in pairs with our audience. 
I would like to thank my teammates, Patty and Michaela, for their work on the production side of our webinars. And of course, I'd like to thank all of you in the audience for joining us. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be part of our audience today. Until next time, goodbye from all of us here at our production team at Hordes Dairyman.